squan squan Twelve years ago, Miles Harrison put it like this. This the two nil and the series. Is he about to write his name into the rugby history books? He most certainly is. And for 12 years, Britain and Ireland turned that over. It ran through hearts, it ran through minds, and it ran through highlight reels so often. One of the most visceral, heartbreaking, and undeniably iconic moments of the professional era. This was rugby at its most a motive. Twelve years ago, Mornay Stain wrote himself into the rugby history books. On Saturday, he put himself on the cover as the 37-year-old lion tamer returned from five years of considering accountancy to do just what he was born to do. Seeing Mornay Stain's name in the Springbok squad immediately made you imagine this moment. You couldn't help it. It's like seeing Faf de Klerk in the stands, assuming he's used the lack of warm-up to shit in Ali Price's locker space, or hearing Will Greenwood's commentary and figuring he's recently got divorced. Some things just go together. It decided not just the series, but the best game of the tour, as the Lions and Springboks finally fired everything in opposite directions, after two tests of falling into each other's traps. It was a game with the same tightness and tension, but a few new flavours thrown into the mix. So, how did the Springboks sear back from behind to win the 2021 Lion Series? A Lions tour is weird. It's like a local club's Boxing Day friendly played at World Cup final intensity. It's a hypothetical question you ask in a pub dropped into top end sport. It's a sports movie taking place in front of your eyes on a quad annual schedule. Lions tours exist in a vacuum. They matter enormously and then they no longer exist. By the time you're watching this, one of the two teams contesting the once in a generation test from this weekend will have already been disbanded. The squad never to play together again. The other is preparing for the actual tournament they're a part of, readying themselves for the actual first game of the actual, actual season. And yet, this was the biggest game many of the players will ever play in. A decisive match they've dreamt of, one day competing in ever since they watched Mornay Stain kick that goal back when they were with children and perhaps inspired by that iconic final thunder twat this tour has been defined by the kicking i think a lot of the reason for the boring criticism of the series is not the fact there's been so much kicking but the fact both sides have kicked the same way two teams have adopted the same tactics and persevered with them for three games in a row now it's been a series that's taught us what happens when an immovable object meets another immovable object both teams have prioritized the chase rather than the territory it's about what happens when the kick comes down rather than where it lands, where it's headed. There were questions as to whether the box would lose their edge from the second test without Hell's most adorable demon faff to clerk, but Reinach put that to bed early, demonstrating perhaps the biggest difference between how the two teams executed that similar strategy on Saturday. This kick is perfect. It's placed exactly the distance Colby can comfortably cover in the time it's in the air with support behind for rock time. But just as importantly, Reinach identifies Lions fullback and the man who combines the hurt locker in the hurt arena, Liam Williams, is deep inside his own half. Williams has the sprint about 35 metres to get near the ball, so Reinach places it 36 metres away. Colby is only covering about 20 metres and hence can solely focus on regathering the high ball, eating up the ground in front of him never really a concern. South Africa then double down. Bigger has dropped back to about the 22 metre line, so LaRue hangs it about 30 metres in front of him. He's got to cover a lot of ground and once again, Mapimpi regathers. This has been the mild difference in flavouring. The Lions have kicked to discombobulate the catcher. The ball hangs near them and then they're hopefully unsure whether it's landing in front or behind. It's hard to judge left or right. South Africa have made it easy enough to tell where it's going to be but really difficult to get into that position. The Nines have aimed for the sweet spot between the furthest ground the chaser can reach and how far the opposition fullback can cover. Williams here is dragged at least 40 metres forward and Mostert trundling just 20 can slap a palm in the air and and bat it back to stop him catching it. And whilst the kick by Pollard a phase or so later might look kind of pointless, it just reminds Williams why he has to stand so deep. Andre Pollard has one of the most complete kicking games of any 10 we've ever seen in rugby, and if you leave space over your shoulder, he will find it, he will exploit it. We saw this too in the box returning to the old, this is one of, one of the best friends. They brought one of their best friends back, the Crossfield Bomb. Old dear friend from the World Cup, a tactic that caused a disproportionate amount of chaos when re-employed. The most important and decisive part 
of this series was the kick chase, which on the long list of phrases people were not hoping to hear this summer ranks somewhere between Henry Slade was right, the vaccine's made of 5G and ham, and I have to say, Tom Hanks' funeral was really beautiful, so it's fitting a moment of getting the kick chase wrong is what cost the Lions the series. This is a really, really excellent kick by Price, it's very good. Curry and Van der Merwe have time to chase, and Visa and LaRue both call for it, the ball bobbling in the air. It then comes down a different trajectory to the one Visa is expecting, and he knocks the ball almost exactly straight up in the air somehow. It's like it's coming out of a cartoon whale. I didn't know physics said it was possible, but there you are. But Am remains alert. The Lions defense is honeypotted around the ball, and Am fixes Price the kicker, and in the process, trips a Van der Merwe and bypasses the entire Lions defence who've all only been following the kick. This is then beyond textbook by Billy LaRue. Seriously, if you play rugby at any level, study what he does here. Instead of taking the temptation of running at or around Conan, he drifts inside. He isn't trying to beat him, he's just luring him as far away from Colby as possible. The drift in field opens a wider gap, making Conan turn his shoulder, at which point LaRue fires the pass. It's astonishing how many players at pro level blow this kind of opportunity every time. I, but blowing opportunity is not something Jason Colby has ever done in his life, who just world classes his way over the try line. I'm not going to say much more because I genuinely have no idea how he do How does he do this? Seriously, how does Jason Colby keep doing things? Like I don't, I don't, is it magic? Is it, and I don't mean magic like in the way people say, oh, movie musicals are magic, even Shane Williams is magic. Like, I mean genuine actual spells and summoning orcs and travelling in fire play, like actual... I think it's actual magic. I think it's the only explanation of how Shazen Colby can do this kind of thing. I think it's actual, actual magic. And speaking of Colby, we better got to see this, but I want to flag something here very quickly because I think it's kind of fascinating. Just as the clerk filled in for Colby on the wing whilst everyone's favourite roller skating hobbit was in the bin last weekend, this week we saw Am or LaRue cover the wing a couple of times so Colby could slot into the clerk mould, thundering out a line to make the big hit. Russell flips it back inside to Adams here, Colby less accustomed and leaving space either side in the way Faf doesn't, but it will be fun to see if South Africa continue to do this, possibly even doubling up at a point in game, having two real tiny nuisances. Because look, much as this was a series defined by kicking, this was a match memorable for the attacking antics of Cheslin Colby and the man who gave the Lions a new lease of life when Dan Bigger was forced off just 10 minutes in. Somewhere between monologuing about a trouser press he bought in 1999 and wondering whether any of the Lions would kiss a macaque if it would win in the series, the ever ramshackle Will Greenwood said on Saturday, Finn Russell coming on means you'll either win by 20 or lose by 20, but the third test could not have proven that more wrong, as Russell showed us just why he is the Messiah and a very naughty boy, downing his can of mojito and spilling onto the pitch to somehow become the only person out there enjoying themselves. Russell was sublime. The attack is obvious. Even the tiny moments such as this, throwing a ball super flat four rather than two Liam Williams, meaning the box can't line him up until after he's caught the ball and made a half break. Or here, this pass is so crisp from nothing, there's nothing on, but it catches and flat footage, which is super rare, and gives Van der Merwe a chance to bump my pimpy. But Russell, as nobody outside Scotland seems to want to admit, but it's definitely the case, has become as good a kicking and game management ten as anyone out there the last two years, and he demonstrated this perfectly. This kick is lovely. South Africa set up to receive Mpimpi covering touchline, LaRue in field, but Russell hits it low between them. He had to really scramble to cover it. Or here, similar idea, Russell punts it low and long between the cover, and the pressure is on LaRue, meaning he can only hit it about 80 metres, giving the Lions an enormous net gain. But look, nobody's come to listen to me rave about Finn Russell's kicking game, which I absolutely could do because it's excellent. Russell transformed the Lions attack, creating and dictating the two best passages the touring team have played all series. After the offloads feeling like a bit of a bluff in the warm-up games, they proved incredibly effective at the weekend. The Bok defence set up to smother, and then in trouble if you work around them. And that's just what happens here, as Conan slips out the mall and pops it to Alan Wynne jones the hand of God in turn, flipping it to the almighty Ken. There have been a few moments this series where games have broken up, where things have opened up momentarily, but neither team has ever really taken advantage until now. Finn Russell calls the ball to himself right away. Lacan Yuam, as ever, is alert, as is Mapimpi. And between them, they shut down every option that isn't fundamental mentally deranged. <laughs> but this is King Finn sanity we're talking about here, and Adams can swerve through after that thing, and this is where the fun really begins. 
Finn takes control. He assesses the Bok defence. In the absence of Dwayne Vermeulen, the South African defence is being marshaled, organised by Franz Malherbe in the number three shirt, and Finn calls for a curry carry right into him. This takes him out of the game and also generates quick ball. The Bok pack scrambling. Finn calls it to himself and pops inside to Adams. Attacking the space the Springbok defensive captain would normally be covering immediately around the ruck. The ball remains fast. Him and Ali Price have such a connection at this point, having played together for about nine years. He scarcely needs to shout, say anything. He just holds his hand up and pops balls left, right, inside, outside. He considers the kick and readjusts. Finn on the floor. The Lions then run phases as fast as possible. Price knowing what his 10 would want. to so just keep the opposition loose, keep them working, keep them playing as fast as possible. This draws the penalty that gets the Lions into the corner for their only try of the game, which we'll come back to later. We'll, get, we'll go back to that. Because right now, I want to talk about nothing in the world except Finn bloody Russell. Finn himself here takes the high ball, always aware of his surroundings. He flicks it back to Williams, who frees Josh Adams down the short side. Apparently he can, he, he can do that. Adams and Ali keep it alive. Courtney, carry, Courtney Coyles carries, and Russell prepares a very specific ball. This pass hits Furlong's outside, and Russell lines himself up at all times, so he's positioned exactly, so Furlong's body language swivelling to pass to him would be identical to a pop pass to Alan Wynne-Jones. The only South African who reads this, as ever, is obviously the Kanye Am, who stands steps in to stop it. But this means once Finn has fixed him, there's a huge gap in the South African defence and the overlap is on. LaRue comes up to cut it off, but Van der Merwe slips back in field until Am gets himself back to make the tackle. Three lines are over immediately. South Africa don't compete for the ball. It's quick ball. Aki carries. Russell then lingers out the back, running just the same line he did earlier, but doesn't call it this time. This phase contracts the Springbok defence. Diolande becomes the only player to fold around, covering for the fact it's just the front row alongside him here. So, Russell hits the runner closest to Diolande. Laws smashing into the centre, two men there to compete. The only quick defender taken care of, this leaves the box with a short side comprising of just the two props. Franz Herbert also stumbling over the ruck as he folds, costing him the time it would take to call for support. The props prove no obstacle, no threat. Russell can ignore them and just eye up Mpimpy and throw an unbelievable pill to Williams. Now, as much as LaRue's execution on the one overlap was perfect, Pollard gives a textbook example for the other side. Committing late, committing fast, and committing hard. Williams is trying to do what LaRue did to Conan, but gets smashed backwards. Don't get me wrong, he still could and should have passed, but I think Hendrik Pollard deserves some credit for a brilliant bit of cover here. It's almost a try, and it's an opportunity opened by Finn Russell being more than a maverick. Just because he throws kamikaze passes doesn't mean he hasn't weighed every one of them up or planned them out. Every inch of his performance on Saturday was calculated, careful, and all the best rugby the Lions played was through him, Russell touching the ball most phases and still calling the shots when he wasn't. This kind of membrane rugby, as I like to call it, where everything is going through one man, the 10 dictating play, is something the Lions were clearly set up to play. This isn't Russell tearing up the book, it's him turning to a different page, which made me wonder, why haven't we seen it at all this series? This isn't the natural game of any of the other 10s in the squad, sure, Farrell and Bigger speak for themselves, but even Marcus Smith is a kind of reactionary fly half. He looks at the picture in front of him and works out the best way to attack it, unlike a George Ford, Gareth Anscom, or even Juicebox Sextropolis, who like to construct an attack over many phases and wait for an opportunity to strike, as Russell did this weekend. However, Bigger performed that role for Wales all six nations, and Farrell was quite comfortable doing it in the World Cup. Either player could have performed, to a greater or lesser degree, the role Russell played on Saturday. Perhaps, you know, there'd be less of this, but there's a high enough skill level to make that game plan work, yet the first 15 minutes suggest that if Bigger had stayed on, they wouldn't have done it, which makes you ask, why? Why did the Lions clearly build an attacking system that could break the spring box down and then remain content and never give it a go? I couldn't give you the answer, I doubt anyone outside the squad itself could, I don't know if even some of them could, but maybe the Lions were just content with how well their mall was going, especially with a few new tricks up their sleeve. Many criticised Tom Curry for this, but it's one of those weird grey area penalties. He got away with something similar in the first test, and it would have opened the way to the line if he'd got away with it here. Then, again, Curry's involved in the build-up for the Ken Owens try. He sets the front jumper, Wynne Jones crouched down in front, but he then runs backwards to the back of the mall revealing a wilder toje behind him. Owens just pops it to him, using the height differential between him and Kitchoff, and meaning players are already engaged. Wynne Jones snaps in the pack, pull round the front of the box line, that's where it's lightest, so essentially kind of targeting a hole. So South Africa try and make up for this, resources pour into what has become the front and back. Conan and Atoje manage to spin and pin the pack until it's only Umbanambi left competing, and Cheslin Colby in front of six forwards. The result is pretty obvious, Jasper Visa tries to commit a professional foul to prevent it, 
but there's no stopping the cannonball once it's been loaded into the cannon. Now, I'm about Cheslin Colbe's size, right? And I want to say the most impressive thing about this score isn't the Lions' intelligence or physicality, it isn't Ken Owens' glorious finish or wonderful good looks, it's the fact Cheslin Colby sees six forwards coming his way, three metres from the try line, and doesn't even pull an oh shit face. But the Lions' best small threat came just a few minutes later. Regulars at the channel may remember the sheer glee this masterpiece of bastardry brought me at the World Cup, and you can only imagine Warren Gatland seeing that live and deciding he had to try and weaponise it against the box themselves. But whereas Erasmus deployed it to secure a cheap free point at a key moment of the game, the Lions use it as an insult. There's no real tactical advantage to forming a mall here on halfway in the corner, but there is an emotional advantage if this works. The Lions called it mere seconds after the Ken Owens try. The Springboks pride themselves on their physicality. If the Lions tear through them for a try from a mall, then outdo them at their own incredibly physical trick seconds later, that's a huge psychological blow. This insult is laughed off by the Springboks, in part because the Lions get it very wrong. South Africa were very careful in the World Cup to not jump at the line out to get the pack into position cleanly, and then only use backs in the rucks for every forward free to maul. But the Lions do jump, then commit Jones and Furlong the next phase, softening the impact. But the timing was impeccable. Fair play to any former school bullies in this Lions pack. They knew exactly the moment to try and kick the box when they were down. South Africa ran their own mall tricks too. Here they put 10 plays into the line-out zone with Am at the tail. Curry drifts to watch him, and even once the centre enters, him and Owen stay out. South Africa are going for the same peel the Lions have used so effectively, but get smuggled up. They then start to play through the phases. Erasmus has said in past he intends to improve and evolve the attack, beyond what they deployed in the World Cup, but here they just do exactly as per. Players pair off, they crash, they smash, every so often they find a half gap or weak shoulder, it's pretty safe. South Africa doing exactly the thing the Lions knew was coming. However, that's something the Lions have been using to their advantage during the passes where they have been trying to evolve their game in the series. One of the great boons of having a reputation is it gives you something to subvert. Everyone expects a huge eight-man shove looking for a penalty of every scrum from South Africa, so the Lions pack are slow to disengage from this scrum as Dear Land Day carries. Curry and Conan can get nearby, but Am takes an extra step in the clear out to slow Curry's fold, meaning the Lions line is unorganised. Ali Price's user on the one who plays so so well for Scotland is reading when this is going out the back, looking to cut off attacks at source or block the pass, but the box playing with unexpected pace leaves him here. Normally there'd be a forward about here, but Price is forced to play two roles here, both of them, he's being both of them, and kind of ends up torn between them. Moster can then come around late, allowing him to pick his line even later so he can assess the space, hit the hole and carry hard. Henshaw aids the tackle, Curry spots something as he's folding, pointing it out to his teammates, this leaves both players in front of Pollard, still finding their position and semi-distracted, and then Duan van der Merwe buys his dummy and steps in on LaRue, meaning Pollard can pick the hole between Curry and Henshaw, and LaRue has some space. This is all about pace, so Reinach clears out himself to keep it fast, and Pollard purposely fires Visa at our key. With things having happened so quickly after the scrum, both front rows were slow to get up, and the Lions front row haven't really found position yet, just, 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 just hanging out here, just having a nice time here, as a group, as, as friends. And once Pollard has got our key out of the way, similar to Russell and Diolande earlier, he knows that there's no one quick, no one to organise the defence. A simple dummy run by Umbanambi takes out everyone inside, and then Diolande fixes laws like World Rugby keep trying to, and Josh Adams is excellent here, actually. It's a kind of optical illusion. It looks like he opens up a gap for Am, but he's really just cutting off the pass to Khaleesi and Mapimpi, sacrificing 10 metres to kill the overlap. Diolande gets in Umbanambi's eye line and causes the knock-on, but the Springboks can go back and kick the penalty. Their newfound pace drew from the Lions. This is all a work in progress. This is something the box is still working on, and we've generally, in this Lions series, seen them pull their new attacking structures about two times a game. I'd wager by the end of the Rugby Championship we'll probably see this increase to about five, six times a game with the hope that they can be doing this all the time by the end of the year. But of course there was much more work to be done. The final 15 minutes summed up the series. Both teams had chances to take the lead and frankly whichever side took that chance would have deserved it. And the Lions did have a chance. This attacking set in the 22 late on is fascinating because it shits all over my idea that the Lions were prepared for Finn's sanity. Russell is calling everything off himself. He's playing that kind of membrane rugby that suits him so well, but the players around him now don't look set up for it. They're sticking around the ball. Even the back sucked in. We should not be seeing players run out of options like Henshaw does twice here unless the tactics are super, super conservative, but Russell keeps trying to vary the play with what he's got and almost manages to open things up. You feel here he's probably thinking Adams on the inside ball, then using that quick ball, then trying to get something with Henshaw and Simmons on the short side, hoping it'll be fast enough to stop the box fold, but then once the Lions do get to the 5 metre line later, they just batter away, not considering going wide and eventually losing the scrum against the head, giving the Springboks their opportunity to win the game. 
South Africa's points per chance ratio in this series has been insane. Jot Naira's side have failed to score from a visit to the 22 just four times across three games. Two of them being solely down to the incredible work of very deserving Lions player of the series, Mauro Otoje, who's been borderline career best this series. And that ability to squeeze a team for points cracked them ahead. Something, okay, vaguely sort of interesting, we're going to speculate for a minute, happens in the lead up to the final penalty. The Springboks play four phases. Two of them are incredibly slow like this. They just take the time, assess their options. But now, look at this. Suddenly, boom, Yankee just wants the ball fast. He spots something. He wants to go quick, 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 quick. But it's just a simple full carry. Just a simple full carry. So what's going on? Whilst Curry and Otoje are fond of a professional foul, the three players who have reputations for giving away dumb penalties in this Lions team are Courtney Laws, Luke Cowan Dickey, and Kyle Sinclair. Now, Sinclair has sorted out his discipline in the last two years. Cowan Dickey's not far off managing that too. And Laws hasn't given away a single penalty in the first three hours of the series, yet they have reputations. So, when one of those three players is in front of the ball carrier in those last 15 minutes, South Africa target them, run at them every time. When none of them are in line, they're kind of waiting like this. The play is so much slower, just running the clock down. But then they see Laws and Cowan Dickey next to each other and attack it like it's an open trial line. Laws gets pinned in, it's daft rather than stupid, it's preventable by him, but the Springboks do work to get him in there. And look, this is speculation rather than hard analysis, but can anyone out there honestly say it doesn't sound like a Razzie Erasmus thing to do? It's so in Razzie's playbook. Not that anyone can keep track of what is and isn't a Razzie Erasmus thing to do anymore. This has been a series of bad blood and antagonism, both between the British Isles and South Africa and the four countries that make up the Lions themselves. It's been tough to remain engaged when the whole tour is so vitriolic and the rugby community the most toxic I've ever seen it. We just have to hope Lions Tours exists in a vacuum and this kind of pointless anger doesn't carry on when the rugby championship begins next weekend or the Northern Hemisphere season begins in September. We have to hope we can all as a community be better than the last few weeks and let that tour sink into the archives. Lions tours exist in a vacuum. They matter enormously until the final whistle goes, at which point they slip instantly into legend. 12 years ago, Mornay Stain wrote himself into the rugby history books, and the ink on his second chapter set 90 seconds after he jotted it down. What we watched on Saturday was a rare match that'll last longer than any of these players. Footage of this game we played back on TV in 2057, 2069. There's more question marks over whether the earth will survive that long than the footage of Morningstein's late second heartbreaking penalty. Hell, if rugby still exists, Morning will still probably be going. The world's first man to nail a touchline conversion with a Zimmer frame. Lions tours are weird. Lions tours are special because Lions tours are immortal. An idea that shouldn't work. A concept that shouldn't last. Creating moments that do. South Africa, we'll see you in 12 years. Mornay, keep that kicking leg loose. Let's all be better then. Thank you for watching that. I hope you enjoyed it. That brings us to the end of the 2021 British and Irish Lions Tour, which is a word I never thought I'd hear, <laughs> never mind actually say. Um, I intend to take a couple of weeks off. I apologise. Sandra, I've always had a problem with uh, me using rugby championship footage anyway, and frankly, I could do just a bit of a lie down, if I'm entirely honest. Uh, so I'm at least not going to cover the first few rounds, but we'll, we'll see beyond that, and hopefully, you know, I can keep on sounds like we can get something sorted out hopefully maybe I've, I've never heard back from them before um but yeah so thank you for watching over the course of the Lions tour there's loads of stuff there's loads of predicting how the Lions are going to attack and in the end I should have just asked are they going to attack because you know we didn't see much of that um but yeah thank you for watching thank you for the support channel on Patreon it's a huge huge bonus allowing me to continue doing this and I'll see you all um soon at some point in the future for rugby I hope you all rugby and I wish you a very rugby 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 Oh my god! Oh my god! Oh my god! Oh fuck! I can't I don't want to sit down. Throw up. Go to the loo. Ah. Oh.